Okay. I'd like to call to order this special meeting of the Board of Education. Laura, can you please call the roll? Garcia. Here. Gebhardt. Nisnik. Here. Rajpal. Here. Sergeant. Here. And can you please state where you're calling from? I'm calling from my house. Thank you. My two daughters are in the house, but they're not in the room at the moment. Thank you. Sweeney Moran. Here. Zess. Here. Thank you. Okay, so we are starting out with a budget presentation this evening. Um, on Zoom, can everyone mute? Rob, did you want to introduce our budget presentation and maybe speak a bit about Portland? I will say Portland for our, our board meeting next week. Um, but I will speak about the budget update. Board members, as you know, uh, developing the district's budget is a process that starts in September and ends in um, never. <laughs> it's, it's really a year-round process and ends when the board approves it uh, at the end of the year. Um, so uh, today is the first uh, budget presentation for the 23-24 uh, budget development year, and so our CFO, uh, Bill Sutter, is here to give you a little bit of a wrap-up from last year's budget and begin to outline the budget development process for this upcoming year. And with that, I'll turn the presentation over to Bill. Thanks, Rob. <clears throat> um, so a, a quick update on where we are this current year, uh, some current information and some uh, sort of national look uh, at uh, funding levels and, and uh, uh, where districts can uh, make good budget choices, and uh, I would suggest that uh, we are doing those good budget choices. So uh, enrollment, of course, this time of year, we're uh, getting students in and uh, getting ready for the October 1st official count day. Uh, we are a little soft uh, on our enrollment counts from what we projected in the budget. Uh, about 300 students down overall, uh, concentrated uh, in the general fund schools, the non-charter, uh, non-preschool uh, realm, and uh, it's about 1% uh, shy of what we were projecting. Uh, it is largely uh, concentrated, or nearly entirely concentrated at the elementary level, uh, with about 3%, 2.9% shortfall uh, there. So uh, this slide is uh, from Edgenomics. It's a Georgetown uh, University uh, educational lab, and they put this together uh, in a presentation. And th so this is national data uh, around projections for student enrollment. So uh, really the idea that where BVSD is right now is uh, consistent with uh, national trends uh, for enrollments. Uh, and that projection of about a half a percent a year uh, is uh, you know, where we are projected to go. Uh, and so it's not uh, outside of what we're seeing nationally and amongst other districts in the front range. So uh, the Edgenomics Lab also put together some uh, bullet points around uh, pressures, funding pressures, largely driven uh, around ESSER funding and the concerns that ESSER funding has been used uh, in ways that will cause um, a fiscal cliff, a significant fiscal cliff for many districts. Uh, the way they have described this, they, they indicate what uh, kind of districts are most at risk. And uh, so, for example, on this first one, uh, boosting spending, uh, so districts that are using the ESSER funds for recurring financial commitments. Um, some districts actually have used uh, resources uh, either freed up by or available directly from ESSER uh, for uh, pay increases, permanent pay increases. Um, the counter to that is in, in Boulder, 
Uh, we certainly uh, do not do that. Uh, we're very careful, and it's consistent with board policy and state law, that we uh, have focused those ESSER funds as well as any district uh, one-time resources on non-recurring expenditures, uh, and particularly with the ESSER uh, COVID response and the, our differentiated funding model uh, for those six high-need schools. Uh, enrollment declines, uh, again, most at risk, districts most at risk, urban centers, uh, districts that were closed longer during the uh, pandemic um, have typically experienced um, more uh, enrollment declines. And also northern states, there has been a trend of uh, movement from northern states to southern states. Uh, in Boulder, our declining enrollment is consistent with those uh, larger national uh, and regional trends. Uh, and we also are very careful to plan into that, uh, making particularly uh, staffing adjustments on an annual basis uh, to address that declining enrollment. Some districts don't do that. They keep uh, consistent staffing and don't uh, adjust for uh, that declining enrollment. Uh, inflation, labor scarcity, and new hiring uh, driving up those recurring commitments. Uh, again, most at risk being offering permanent raises uh, that are larger than typical or expanding uh, ongoing staff. Uh, in Boulder, we manage salary increases uh, consistent with our past practices, uh, and we don't add to ongoing staff uh, with one-time resources. Whenever we do add staff with one-time resources, we're very clear about the purpose and the length uh, of which uh, those positions will be uh, funded, so that, uh, which is either one year, sometimes we go up to three years, uh, but at least there's a, a path forward and a, a def defined uh, role that will change and gives us time to adjust that. Uh, Bill, the, sorry, oh, yes. I see that Kitty has her hand up in the presentation. I'm not sure how long this is. Is it better to take questions in the middle or to hold till the end? Either. Doesn't okay, matter. well, Kitty, why don't you go ahead then? So my question was on the previous slide saying S, when ESSER runs out, does it run out on the 24th of September or does it run out in September 2024. September of 2024. Thank you. The uh, economic slowdown um, affecting state revenues. So uh, districts that are dependent on state revenue or some states that are more uh, dependent on economic conditions or uh, can be more affected by the economic slowdown. Uh, in Boulder, we certainly have uh, greater flexibility with our local resources, uh, our very uh, consistent and generous uh, local voters. Um, the state revenue or the state revenue formula, we are largely dependent on that, but uh, with the additional funds that we receive uh, from mill levy overrides, that gives us a little bit more flexibility than uh, districts that are uh, constrained entirely by uh, the School Finance Act. Uh, for staffing, uh, these are just three in particular uh, budget pressers that we're facing in the current year. So as we uh, adjust our staffing for that uh, declining enrollment uh, and uh, slightly larger declining enrollment than projected, uh, we'll eliminate the staffing reserves, uh, the, the sort of standard ongoing staffing reserves that are just part of the normal allocation process. Uh, then certainly related to that is employee recruitment and retention uh, with a tight labor market. Uh, it is continues to be uh, difficult to recruit in some uh, particular job areas uh, and then retaining folks, uh, job jumpers. Uh, last year when I made this presentation, I had a slide uh, from the state revenue forecast that showed that wages increased more for folks that jumped between jobs uh, than folks that stayed in jobs. So when the ta when you have a tight labor market, uh, it's more difficult to retain people because they're out looking for other jobs. 
Uh, and then we do have to shift additional staffing from the ongoing funds to the one-time funds as we transition uh, from one year to the next. When we don't have an, uh, the students show up, uh, we don't go in and make reductions in staffing. In the current year, we let that play out for the remainder of the year to keep consistency in the classrooms and the students that are assigned to teachers uh, and then make the adjustments in the following uh, school year. On enrollment, uh, as I mentioned, we're not meeting our June budget adopted projections. Uh, we've already hired staff for many of those positions. Uh, it is concentrated at the elementary grades, uh, which will lead to larger staff reductions in following years. Uh, we do leverage attrition. It gives us the ability to uh, make uh, uh, overtures uh, around um, resignations and retirements. Uh, but uh, gives us some time to plan into that. Uh, but it does increase the number of staff positions that need to be uh, adjusted to bring it down to the uh, staffing levels that we should have for the number of students we have. And then inflation, uh, the June revenue forecast uh, had it at 7.9% average annual inflation for Colorado. Uh, that was up from 7% in March. On Thursday, uh, two days from now, the state revenue uh, the state revenue forecast will come out, uh, and they'll have an updated number. Um, so we'll see if that is creeping up again or if it is uh, starting to subside. And then certainly, with that inflation co comes pressures on operational costs uh, and the continued wage pressures. Uh, so this slide has been used uh, a few times before. Uh, the, when we see enrollment drops, uh, it's about $3 million uh, for every 1% in enrollment. The averaging formula within School Finance Act softens that impact of declining enrollment over multiple years. Uh, I added this third bullet point uh, that averaging the averaging piece of the formula is targeted by some state legislators uh, to change or eliminate or eliminate from the School Finance Act uh, as a way to for the state to save uh, dollars. It's um, because many districts, uh, it's not all districts in the state, but a vast majority uh, are experiencing declining enrollment. Um, that would be seen as um, not very favorable for a number of districts, uh, particularly large districts. Uh, yeah. So the chance that it will get changed is um, uh, less likely uh, because the number of legislators whose districts uh, will be impacted uh, would be a significant number of legislators. Um, but it does come up consistently as a conversation piece uh, during the interim school finance uh, committee. And then uh, with a 1% drop in enrollment is about 12 fewer teacher FTE and fewer support staff uh, with our standard staffing formulas. So this slide, when, our, when we get the uh, September revenue forecast in a couple of days, uh, this is just a reminder that in the September forecast, there's only about 14% of the data that the state has uh, to make that forecast out through June 30th uh, of next year. So uh, it's um, a, a tad squishy when it comes to being a forecast at this point in time, but it is uh, at least a, a data point that we have uh, to continue thinking about budget development in the following year, uh, as well as whether there are any indicators uh, that we could have mid-year adjustments uh, in the current year. There's a couple of ballot measures that have the potential to impact uh, district operations uh, positively uh, uh, with some challenges. So Proposition FF uh, to reduce income tax deduction amounts to fund school meals program measure. Uh, is a uh, adjustment of the income tax deduction uh, to provide uh, healthy school meals for all, uh, to reimburse participating schools, to provide free meals for all students. Uh, it's a little bit more nuanced than what we experienced in the last couple of years with the federal program of just allowing all students to be uh, counted as uh, free lunch and um, going through the lines and getting reimbursed at the federal level. Uh, there are some additional hoops that you need to jump through to um, qualify and, and have the district participate, but it certainly provides a, that 
that, that school meals for all uh, standard going forward. And then our capital bond program, uh, 350 million capital bonds uh, of general obligation bonds, um, about $9 on a $600,000 home. And so that will uh, ramp up um, while we're experiencing the uh, inflationary increases uh, that have been planned into it, uh, but certainly um, in that tight labor market uh, that can uh, provide some challenges as the um, uh, opportunities also that exist within it to um, fix and maintain school buildings. Next steps uh, in the budget are the October count, obviously, uh, where we uh, derive the majority of our funding in the district through the School Finance Act. Uh, there's a 10-day window uh, around that October count. If it uh, falls on the weekend, uh, which October 1 falls on a Saturday, so that means October 3rd on Monday is the official count day, uh, five days either side, uh, five uh, school days at either side is the official count window. Uh, Pre-K has a November 1st count, then we submit that information to the state and it's finalized on November 30th. So uh, that will, again, answer that question of, uh, right now we're projecting based on a uh, two years worth of data averaging uh, for that uh, student shortfall of about 300 students. Uh, we, we're still a little ways out from that October 1st, uh, and then the data cleanup that happens after that. The November 1st governor's budget for the 2023-24 20, uh, fiscal year, uh, that is an indication if there's any uh, funding changes that might happen in the current year. Uh, there have been some suggestions in the past years uh, to make changes in the current year as well as uh, what, uh, what the governor has planned for the following year. It's really a starting point for the uh, legislative process for the following year. Uh, it's not set in stone. It's, uh, we like to consider it a floor rather than a ceiling of where K-12 funding might go, uh, but it's at least a good indicator. And then uh, November 8th for the election results uh, that uh, come about. Next steps, we have some district financial updates, uh, quarterly financials, and then the annual audit. The December state revenue forecast uh, again, uh, additional information coming in, uh, more information for the legislature to ponder, and then also uh, if there's any indicators of uh, changes in the current year or for the next fiscal year. And then the revised budget for the current year will come in January for study and adoption. We'll pause there for just a second and see if there's any questions I haven't nobody's indicated, but just in case. Katie, did you have any more questions right now? <laughs> no. Bill, did you say we're short by 300 students? Yes, about 300 students from what we projected, uh, and that projection was to be down about uh, 200 students. So. It's about 500 students from last year uh, overall. And the bulk of that is K-5 inside the city of Boulder? Um, I'm not sure by area where that is, but definitely K-5. Rob, when are we getting our next uh, presentation on enrollment numbers? December. Okay, thank you. So for the that's supposed to be the 23-24 budget development process. Timelines and milestones, uh, this is probably a uh, section of the presentation that most board members can uh, give on their own as I've consistently done it for about a decade. Um, but uh, generally this is uh, an indicator for the public uh, to have an idea of where uh, opportunities exist, where information comes from, and when decisions get made uh, throughout the budget development process. So the timeline from September to June, uh, when the budget has to be adopted, uh, is uh, opportunities, multiple opportunities for stakeholder input 
So these are all the uh, committees and councils that exist in the district, uh, staff and public comments at board meetings all go into uh, budget development uh, decision making. Next we layer on the Board of Education meetings, the scheduled Board of Education meetings and uh, Board of Education work sessions uh, that are scheduled. Next we layer on what we call our data inputs. So these are uh, points along the way where we get information that uh, helps give an indication of where we are in the current year, where we might end the year, or what uh, is happening in the following fiscal year. So these are those uh, current year revenue forecasts, uh, our quarterly financials, our audit, um, the DAC budget recommendations in January, uh, some insurance rates, uh, enrollment projections, uh, and then all the way down to the end in early May when the General Assembly is finally done. It's usually at the very end of the session where uh, the School Finance Act is finalized. So again, this is information is coming in all along the process uh, to help those decisions along the way. Next, we layer in uh, what we consider our feedback loops. So these are uh, Board of Education meetings or work sessions where the conversations happen around uh, the points along the way. These are scheduled meetings, so that's not to say that there couldn't be an additional meeting, but these are just the ones along the way uh, where we have a scheduled work session or board meeting to specifically uh, discuss the budget. Next, we have action items. So this is uh, the major commitment of the budget is those staffing allocations that happen largely February through April. They continue obviously into May, June, July, uh, but the majority of staff is rolled out uh, to schools in that February through April timeline. And then there are some uh, notifica official notifications to employee groups uh, if there is a reduction in force. Uh, this is not to suggest that that is uh, expected or indicated, but these are just uh, specific dates within contracts uh, that need to be met uh, if there's going to be any action. So it's more of a notification than uh, an action item. And then the deadline is the statutory deadline for budget adoption uh, is June 30th, although we have typically uh, scheduled that for the first meeting in June. Then we layer all these together uh, to give an indication of you know, where those action items are happening, how we have data coming in all along, and those feedback loops uh, that uh, help uh, frame the issues, uh, answer the questions, and make, uh, help, uh, make decisions along the way. Some challenges uh, going into next year's budget development. It's not a surprise, but those shifting student enrollment patterns, uh, variability and risk in the state budget forecast, impacts of state and local ballot initiatives, uh, the pandemic, continuing pandemic impacts on staffing, teaching and learning, competing priorities for staff time, uh, and use of one-time funds for initiatives. So that is the end of the presentation. Kitty, do you have any questions? No, thanks for asking. Um, Rob, I'm wondering, when we're looking at these 300 students that we anticipated that we don't have, and we're calculating that out to 12 FTEs, give or take, are we mostly looking at schools that anticipated three rounds and ended up with two, or are we looking at schools where we thought we would have two and we ended up with one, or, or something different? So, so to remind the board, um, regardless of what we projected staffing for, we hold schools harmless, right? So uh, we didn't take any teachers away from any schools that didn't meet their enrollment projections. Um, so I, I don't know specifically, to answer your question, what schools, what teachers would come from what schools. These are just kind of generalities that Bill kind of shares to give, give the board and the public kind of an estimate of what that looks like. Um, what we will do is, is as we go and readjust our projections over time, and this will happen around March next year when we roll out staffing to our schools. Right, at, that's at the point where we'll let folks know what the reduced staffing number is. Board members will typically at that point start to get emails uh, from folks wanting to keep staff above their staffing 
um, allocations. But as a reminder to the board and to the public, the reason that we're able to compensate our people in the ways that we do um, and, um, and, and we're able to maintain that competitive wage is that we don't overhire teachers based on the agreements that we've made with BVEA. And so those reductions are critically important to be able to maintain our staffing within the realm of what we have agreed and what we project to do. Uh, so that's a long answer to a very short question. I'm not sure where, where those teachers would be coming from. I understand. And, and obviously my general inquiry is just trying to understand whether we have schools that have been large that are shrinking to medium or medium-sized schools that are getting quite small. Um, but I hear we're having a presentation in December. Can we anticipate that there will be a lot more data around these these specific issues of 300 students, which seems larger than anticipated then? Sure. Well, um, again, the official accounts start um, during this next 10-day window. And just as a reminder to the board and to the public, a student has to show up one day within that window to be counted as a student as part of that count. Um, so they have 10 days to show up one day. So any students that wouldn't show up for a day wouldn't count. Um, so we'll have accurate counts of students within the next 10 to 15 days. Um, and then we can reflect that within our enrollment presentation in December, in which we can talk specifically on, on what schools were impacted and if there was um, a school that was heavily impacted or if it was just a little bit kind of across the board. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the board? Uh, Rob? I'm not asking myself a question, but I. <laughs> I uh, just uh, want to thank Bill again for the consistency and quality in the budget presentations that, that he's able to present. And you know he highlighted some things at the beginning of his presentation that I think is important for our community um, and for this board uh, to understand, which is we're following best practices in regards to school finance, that we're not putting long-term expenditures on one-time um, one dollars. And, uh, and, and the, the school districts that are doing this, and this is happening across the country, um, reacting to pressures in regards to wages and other things, uh, the pressures are creating this idea of we're going to take one-time money that's either a backfill from ESSER or directly from ESSER and with the commitment that we'll just make cuts down the line. Uh, and uh, to even things out, and, and that's not best practice, and we haven't done that. So I want to thank Bill for his steadfast leadership in regards to our finances. Um, there's a reason that we have one of the highest bond ratings in the state of Colorado. There's a reason we have a, that we have uh, the reserves that we have and that we've gotten the awards we've gotten around finance. And just want to thank Bill and the entire team, um, the finance and budget team. Absolutely. Thank you, Rob. Um, so I see next we have one more item on our agenda, the legislation around FRL. Who is leading that presentation? Also Bill? Oh, you. Excellent. So Bill is going to drive the presentation, and I'm going to speak to the presentation. I'm not sure if, Rob, if you wanted to come up just to give keep Bill company up here um, and then potentially answer any operational questions. And so board members, as, you, as you'll recall, uh, about a month ago, we had a conversation at the board table around, is there something that we could do as a district in response to um, the idea that there are more students and families who really need either free or reduced lunch than qualify by federal guidelines? And so what I shared with you at that point in time is, why don't we do a little bit of digging we can present that information to the board and, and to the public, and then we can have a conversation around potential next steps um, as we think about how this will weigh in amidst the many budget priorities that we'll have moving forward. But we've done a little digging. I've, I've made some connections, and I'm and, um, happy to present that information uh, today. So um, as we think about our current process and calculation, uh, this slide is pretty um, self-explanatory. Uh, for a family to qualify for free reduced lunch, this is a federal process. Uh, they have to fill out the form first and foremost. Um, I know that that's electronic, but we also, I believe that we've made paper copies in, as a response um, to our, our, our schools and our families who needed an easier way to be able to fill that form out. So we've done some adjusting on that. Um, and then those who qualify by the federal guidelines, which um, if you look at the table down below, depending upon the number, the members in the household, um, their annual gross income would qualify them for free or reduced. 
um, and then the state provides us the funding for those students within our budget, which we then use to offset the costs um, to provide those students free or reduced lunch. I'll pause there. This, there's a lot of stuff on this slide, and um, Bill or Rob or I can answer any questions you might have, or we can proceed. Kitty, go ahead. So um, a household with one member, would that mean a student who is supporting themselves? I'm going to go with yes. <laughs> OK. That just seems highly <laughs> likely. It does. It, it might. Possible. It might be that you know this is the same scale that's used for other um, uh, other decisions at the at, on a federal level, uh, but this is the the scale that is available on the federal website. Well, and it may be Thank worth you. it may be worth noting that with our McKinney Vento students and teens in particular, that it doesn't actually seem that unlikely that we probably have a number of students who are single family households in our district. Bill, if you'd like to proceed to the next slide, thank you. And so to give you kind of an overview, uh, board members, of what percentage currently qualify utilizing this process, um, right now we have about 20.3% of our students who qualify under those thresholds as of October of last year. So we don't have the calculations for 2022. Um, and when you were to, if you were to compare that 20.3%, uh, Bill and I were looking back at the data over the years. I think in 2014 it was 20.5 percent ish. So, so this percentage has stayed pretty consistently for almost a decade in our community. Um, and these are the schools that um, hit our Title I thresholds, um, which is based on the number or the percentage of students who qualify for free and reduced lunch which is 40% at elementary and 75% at middle and high school. Um, and in, in many of these instances, many of these schools, if you were to look um, kind of at the longitudinal data, uh, the percentage of students who qualify is declining at some of these schools. At others, I think it's maybe stayed the same. Um, and we have Emerald and Arapahoe Ridge, which will transition off of Title I funding after this school year. Once a school doesn't qualify, we give them another year of those additional dollars and resources. As a Title I school, schools are qualified for additional resources um, and funds. Um, and then we give them a bridge year, and then, and then that, those funds and those dollars go away, uh, because that is based on poverty percentage. Rob, excuse me. Can you explain Title I for the community members that might be listening, to, if they're not familiar with that concept? Bill had his mic on. Do you want to? Is there the, the non-technical answer yeah. for Title One? Is 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 a Title One school is a school that serves a certain percentage of students who qualify for free to reduce lunch. In BVSD, if you are more than forty percent free and reduced lunch at elementary, you qualify as Title One, and if you are more than seventy-five percent in middle and high school, you qualify as Title One. That's a great non-technical answer. Thank you. Uh, the district has provided funding is federal funding, uh, federal uh, grant. And um, a couple of things to note. So uh, under the federal guidelines, you can't serve a school that is less than 35 percent uh, free and reduced lunch. And you're required to serve a school that is more than 75 percent. So that's kind of where those two thresholds uh, have, uh, are why they exist that way. Um, we have no middle schools that are uh, at that 75 percent, um, there has also been uh, there. You can make a selection around uh, grade level concentrations, uh, like how you select the percentage in the schools, and so you can rank order. Uh, the district has historically chosen to concentrate its Title I funds at the elementary level, early intervention, uh, you know, get the most bang for the buck. Um, with the significant drop, it was like a 50% drop in our funding uh, for Title I as a result of the 2020 census, the district fell below a concentration uh, that there's a, a factor uh, built into the formula, the Title I formula, and that's why we had such a significant drop. So uh, 
slight drop in the number of students overall, percentage staying fairly consistent, but we're also uh, starting to hit that decline in enrollment a little bit. Um, so it, it, those pieces are kind of coming together uh, with a shift in the concentrations at some schools uh, and then this concentration as a community uh, really driving down the funding uh, overall for Title I. Rob, uh, we've got a question from Kitty, too. Kitty, go ahead. Um, yes, do we have experience with transitioning other schools off Title One, and um, how do we anticipate that's going to work for them? Uh, Whittier, Birch, Creekside have all transitioned off uh, in the past. Not sure if there was another one. Um, so it's typical and consistent with our past practice. Uh, once a school dips below that 40% threshold, uh, we give them a year transition uh, to you know, make adjustments uh, in schedules and plans and, and uh, not just cut it off uh, immediately. Kitty, do you have any follow-ups? I'm sorry, I started asking. I didn't have my question, my, my microphone on. Yes. Um, do we know is that sufficient? And do the schools continue on their growth process? I guess I'm just curious. You know, what we can do to keep supporting them to make sure the, the kids are still improving in their achievement. Well, just to be clear, uh, because the school does not become Title I, has nothing to do with performance. It has everything to do with the percentage of students that are, are qualifying um, for free or reduced lunch on the federal process as it is today. I will say, right, but it does have to do with money, right? It, it does have to do with resources. And so um, I would say that if you were to look at Creekside, Birch, and Whittier, I'm not sure when they, when they rolled off, but but certainly um, all three of those schools um, are at performance um, on the school performance framework. I will say that you know, our response to, to providing resources based on academic needs is our way to differentiated funding. Um, and so that, that doesn't, isn't affected by this process at all. Thank you. Richard, go ahead. Title I does allow schools that qualify for Title I to buy services for the school, right? Like they can put their money into early childhood or whatever they want to do with it. Uh, for early childhood, there has to be a, a designation that it's going to be used for early childhood. The district has not, schools have not chosen to uh, use uh, Title I funding for early childhood uh, in the past. And it's not to say you can't, but uh, it hasn't been used in the past that way. Right, but, the, but they can go ahead and choose to see if, in fact, there's kids that are reading below grade level uh, that they can hire more staff to increase the staff for reading interventions or whatever they do. 100%. They have to yeah. uh, make a plan. Uh, it has to be approved by the state. I mean, it's, it's um, the federal funds are highly regulated. Uh, so there are lots of hoops to jump through for schools uh, to, to comply with those plans. And there are some extra requirements for Title I schools as it relates to some of the federal requirements around family engagement and all that wonderful stuff, yeah. Absolutely, they have to set aside a certain amount of their funds uh, to do family engagement, yep. Thank you. That was a quiz. Any more Title I questions before we move on? Okay, Rob. So uh, we did some calling around to, and the question that I was asking folks, and I, I most of my calls were at kind of the, the national level, uh, who across the country is doing something either locally or at the state level beyond uh, 
the federal threshold. And so we found a couple of examples, two statewide examples, one example that has kind of numerous um, nu numerous districts that have, that have done that. Um, so in Oregon, uh, there is a state law that uh, created a different threshold where funding, um, if the children's household income is 300% or below the poverty line, um, they were able to receive free school meals. Um, and then they use the same free and reduced lunch price application to qualify, and they call that the Oregon Expanded Income Guidelines. New Jersey just passed the Working Class Families Anti-Hunger Act, uh, which is at 200 percent um, or below the poverty line. Um, those students are eligible for free meals, um, and that translates to, to the, the numbers that you see there. And then the most common um, ways in which, in which districts across the country are combating this um, this idea of providing um, healthy, nutritious food for, for all students is providing a free breakfast for all uh, as opposed to a free breakfast and free lunch. Now, um, I will say that this, in this, in this um, upcoming school year, there is a Colorado example of a district that's providing free lunch and breakfast for everyone, and that's Greeley-Evans. And uh, there are like 60-some percent as a district 70. 70 percent. So they've set aside one-time dollars, and I'm not sure where those funds are coming from, if they're ESSER or other other funds, at-risk funds, whatever that might be. Um, and they're paying for every um, student in Greeley-Evans to get free breakfast and free lunch this school year. Um, so that's a, but, but that's a one-time expenditure, and so that's one example that we've seen. The one qualifier for that is they're asking everybody to submit the form and then if you don't qualify, which 30% of their families won't, uh, then you'll still qualify. So it's hard to say if they'll say, you didn't turn it in so you don't get free lunch, they probably won't do that. But that was the sort of structure on how they were doing is having everybody turn in the form. And I have one more slide, and then we can kind of open it up for discussion. And so, and so in, in addition to what's happening in Greeley-Evans, uh, there are, um, this is how Colorado is thinking about this differently. I think that uh, we've talked about Bill in his, his budget presentation, Proposition FF, uh, which would provide free meals um, for um, all students, uh, and it would reduce tax deductions for those earning 300000 or more from 30 for single filers um, and 60 for joint filers to 12000 for single filers and 16 for joint filers. And then those dollars would be used to offset the costs um, for participating schools. Now, I don't know, that's not dollar for dollar cost coverage. I think that there's some things that have to be figured out in that, in that equation, but that would get you really close. Is that a fair statement, Bill? Yeah, you have to um, exercise all the options to get as much federal funding as possible before the state is going to step in. So there's some... So it's like a last-in type of a... Yeah. So you have to do all those other things. So it's a last-in type of an effort. Um, and then there's... Uh, the, the state is thinking differently about the student poverty measure overall in the school finance formula with House Bill 22-1202. And I don't know, Bill, if you want to just talk a little bit about that or if it's just self-explanatory here in the text. Yeah, the, the interim school finance um, uh, committee, I guess it's called, uh, which has been meeting for several years, um, maybe even decade, uh, is looking for, has been looking for um, a better way uh, to get uh, a, an indicator of student success or student struggles based on poverty. And the free and reduced lunch process is um, uh, not the, uh, the cleanest way. It's, kind of, it's suggested maybe the easiest because districts have to do that to participate in the national lunch program. Uh, but the things like um, the community el eligibility, uh, students that qualify for other uh, state and federal programs, uh, and uh, whether that's an indicator, uh, the um, 
using census block data, which can get pretty granular, uh, and have those be indicators uh, and drive funding uh, to districts. Uh, it adds some layer of uh, complexity, certainly, to the uh, school finance formula uh, when it gets figured out and hasn't been uh, completely ironed out yet. Uh, so uh, it continues to be in discussion and how how to bring that into the, the School Finance Act formula um, uh, to drive funding uh, to students in poverty, to districts with students in poverty. And I'll, um, so if you want to go to the next slide, I'll make a statement kind of on where we are um, and then open, turn, at least I'll turn it over to you and the board to have a discussion on next steps, potentially what you'd want to do as a board and what you'd want to direct staff to do. Um, when we start to thinking to think about if we wanted to do something like say for example we said and this is the question we asked ourselves like how much would it cost us to give every kid a free breakfast a free lunch every day and so the the rough estimate we haven't done deep modeling around this is that you would take the revenue that you generate from the funds that you charge people for for uh, meals, you would deduct that, and you would add the additional food costs that we had to incur last year when everybody qualified for free, um, for free lunches. And so, right now, give or take three and a half million dollars of revenue is what we generate through our school lunch program to offset costs. That would go away, and we would add an additional million dollars in food costs as just a very rough estimate. So an overall net of four and a half million dollars per year uh, based on what we saw last year. Now numbers are a little bit different. I mean, that's not an exact, but we feel like that's a really good starting point to give you the ballpark of what that would take uh, to do that on a year over year basis. We haven't modeled out anything else. We haven't, I think that the important thing for us to plan for something is, is a district if we wanna make um, some steps in this direction is that you'd have to get a sense of the costs associated and it's the reduced revenue and increased food costs um, and, and, and how would different ways that you would look at that, like what, what would that net out to be? And then that would have to be a budget priority then matched up against the other budget priorities and um, some of the budget challenges that Bill laid out for us earlier uh, with we know that we're going to have to reduce staffing. We know that we have increased labor costs. We know we have um, um, uh, lots of other things that, that we have to prioritize. And so that would have to be weighed against those other priorities as well. So uh, that's our presentation to help guide your conversation. And it could be that you all have a quick conversation, ask us to come back with some more information. We'd be happy to do that. You could potentially uh, uh, guide or, or direct the staff to, to draft a resolution in support of Proposition FF, which would be the fastest way to generate the funds to get to the place of getting free lunches for all students um, in, in not only in BVSD but across the state. Um, but I will stop talking and I'll turn it over to you. Oh, oh or I'll answer Stacy. Am I remembering correctly that there was a time that we provided breakfast in elementary schools pre-pandemic? I seem to recall that that happened. Is it still happening or it's not happening? Free breakfast Only or at just Title offering I? breakfast? Free breakfast. At the Title I schools we do and we still currently And we do. still do that. Yep. Okay. And just yep. at the Title I schools? Yes. Okay. When you say a million, is that for breakfast and lunch, just lunch, just breakfast? What is that? I think it's a guesstimate on all food costs. Oh, okay, for the whole shebang. Again, we could we could do some more specific estimations and price costing as if you all want to have a discussion and kind of direct us on what to do. But it's just a guess, a really rough guesstimate. Okay, thank you. Uh, all right. Oh, sorry, Nicole. Did you? No, no. Please go ahead. Out of curiosity, some of the states that you mentioned use three hundred percent folks making 300% um, of the um, federal amount. Do we have a sense of how many students in our school district would meet that requirement at all? 
we haven't looked at that at all. That you know, we found the models. We haven't pressed those models up against the district, or then done. You know, you know, what would the eligibility be, um, and then you know, trying to do any cost modeling. Um, but there's New Jersey was at 200 percent, and Oregon was 300 percent. Again, those were both statewide initiatives. So, um, the census data that does get down to a zone level uh, there is some uh, income level information related to that so it's possible to get to some zones within the district that you know on average whatever the the income level is X percent or whatever above or below um, we don't collect any of that information on anybody who doesn't turn in the form. So we really have no idea with district data what what that would look like. So it would have to be uh, outside census data uh, from that that fairly granular look that would that would be the only way that we could uh, make any estimates on that. And then one more question with that House Bill 22, I don't know because the slide's not up. Um, if we, if they, if that passes and they change how folks are identified at, as at risk, do all of those kids, would they all then qualify for free and or reduced lunch or is it just they're, they're being noted as academic risk but it's not gonna change how we, how we allocate free and reduced lunch? It does not change the um, school lunch program. It's just how the, the state derives um, at risk funding uh, based on different factor than free and reduced lunch. Stacy, go ahead. Do we have a sense what percentage of those who qualify for free and reduced lunch don't apply? Who would qualify who would but qualify don't, apply? don't apply? Because you have to actually apply. Right which I think is the sticking point here in my mind because um, there's a pride issue. People don't want to admit that they're in trouble. That's what worries me about all of this stuff because I think either everyone should get it <laughs> um, because I feel like there would be a lot of people who qualify that would be, that's not for me, have a too proud to do it. Um, which you can all understand, but I think that happens more than we know. So I'm wondering if that's tracked at all, if we have any idea how many qualify currently but do not apply. The only piece of information that we could potentially look at as some type of indicator is our is is potentially that you know the we don't deny kids food who come in line, but we do at the end of the year have to zero out budgets and balances for folks that for one reason or another didn't pay. Um, and so that would be the only thing that, but, but that not, might not be accurate either, Stacy. right? I think that this is, this is this, the data we're looking for is gonna be elusive. Um, and even within the Oregon or New Jersey program, like you still have to, like you have to tell the state, you know, based on the for the form, what your income level is, and it just creates a different threshold. So, but because the thre thresholds are different, different more people will fill out the form, right? So that's why. So, um, but 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 I I I would I think it's safe to say that more people qualify than apply. Isn't it also true, though, that compared to ways that school districts have done this in the past, BVSD has worked hard to implement a system where the only folks that know if somebody's applying for FRL are the people receiving that application? Is that correct? So if you are using your FRL code at school, there's absolutely nobody at your school who would be aware of that information beyond the district level where you'd applied? It's highly confidential and regulated, and uh, administrators are authorized to know. Uh, but um, Kathleen can speak to the don't mess with the federal data kind of idea. Yeah, we made some additional changes to that process. There is a specific uh, recognition in the law that families can consent to have that information, that eligibility information shared 
if they want it shared for purposes of looking at other fee waivers or um, similar issues. So last year we modified the FRL form to include that specific consent provision and we've changed our practices and documentation to be consistent. Thank you. Richard? Uh, the uh, universal breakfast program was only for Title I schools? Title I, yeah. I believe, and I'll, I, I'll verify that, but I'm pretty sure yeah. we're only doing it at Title I schools. Because I thought it was in all schools, but... It <clears throat> all right. we, we did expand it um, several years ago, uh, and it was, uh, it didn't, for paid students, it didn't get the traction uh, to make it cost effective, really, quite frankly. It was very expensive and kind of impactful at the, at the classroom level. So it was not a free universal breakfast program. It was just a universal breakfast program for all students, but they had to pay. Got it. Right. Okay. Uh, the Proposition FF, I think, is probably a good way to go. I have a question around that, though. It talks about participating schools. What does that actually mean? What, talk about it. Talk, t tell me about that a little bit, because I'm not sure if, if FFF, FF is approved by the voters, not all schools are going to participate or what? Uh, I believe it has to do with that um, idea that you have to exercise all the available options to get as many students qualified as possible. And by going through the community eligibility, you don't have to fill out the form. Therefore, students can qualify or you get a high enough percentage in a school that the whole school qualifies which increases the federal reimbursement and would decrease the amount that the state would have to put in. So um, the, by choosing the uh, community eligibility, uh, it, it's not necessarily a cost-effective route for all schools, any school to choose, because you have to get to that certain threshold and then if if it's not high enough, then the district is on the hook for providing the, the free lunches. So the, the school qualifies, but the feds say you're not getting um, the funding for it, is my rough understanding of it. Yeah, but the feds would only reimburse the children that qualify for FRL based on the FRL guidelines. That, right? That's where the community eligibility thing is different because it's using a different data set than the, the forms. Oh, okay. So that, that's where in this Prop FF you have to go through all of those other options to basically reduce the burden on the state uh, and then if the, uh, then the state will step in and backfill. Rob was saying that it's only 75% of the, yeah. of the meal cost. They reimburse the 75% of the meal cost, so I think it was $3.50. Meal costs around 450. Does that sound about right? Yeah, somewhere around there. So 75 percent of the reimbursement. Right, because we have some schools that maybe have 10 percent of their student enrollment that qualify for FRL, maybe even less than that in some of our schools currently, right? And then you have schools that have a higher percentage, like your Title I schools, for example. Uh, so, is it up to the school? to say that they want to participate or how does that work i mean how it's a district decision so the district would then say all schools participate or it's a it can be a school by school choice or a district-wide choice i believe greeley is the using this year as a transition year to do a district-wide community eligibility uh, so that's why they're um, planning but, on using one time. But when you're looking at 70% of the school population, I mean, come on. They're, you know, yeah, they're pretty close overall. Yeah. Versus us here, which is probably maybe percentage-wise. 20% 20%. Yeah. Can I just add uh, to that? I'm with you, Richard. I feel like the Prop FF is the natural next step for us. So I guess a question would be, do we have any information about how well that's polling, how likely that is to become a reality? after the, the election season? I have not heard any recent polling data. 
Yeah, I'm unaware. I'm, I'm unaware of poll or uh, of any polling data. Um, is it the hunger free Colorado? I think would probably have the most up to date information on that. Um, but uh, but again, I think that. Uh, you know, to, to the extent that this is a priority for this board, right, that your actions that are available to you are to, you know, pass a resolution to support and then add that to our legislative priorities. But it, again, it's a voting thing. It's not really. I would say it, it at one point or another, it pulled high enough for people to support getting it on the ballot, right? I mean, it's it didn't pull so low that nobody supports it. Kitty, Kitty's had her hand raised for a while. Kitty, can you go ahead? Yes, yeah, thanks. So I just want to clarify something <clears throat> Kathleen said about um, families giving their consent to um, share information in order to get other fees reduced. Uh, Kathleen, are you saying that if they want to get other fees reduced, they have to consent to their information being shared? <laughs> No, they do not have to consent to their information being shared. That's something that our schools have uh, a lot of school and principal-based processes to support families. This is just one easy way when families are going through the process of filling out the form and providing the information that they can agree to its use up front. But they certainly don't have to. You can complete the FRL form and not provide that consent. And then the data is used exclusively for meal benefits. Yeah, I would just hate to have it um, appear coercive when we're offering parents you know, the, uh, the opportunity to consent to share their information. I believe it's also our practice that um, a school can make that decision unilaterally on their own. Um, they just can't use an unauthorized designation of free lunch to make that decision. If they get information, uh, we, we've given them authority to, to say that uh, fees for a student can be waived. OK, thank you. Just, Richard, go ahead. <clears throat> uh, just to follow up on that, and I know that we're kind of straying away from the topic, but just a quick question on, on the federal guidelines if you know they've changed a little bit does that include the change to share information with other agencies so for example a lot of families qualify for section 8 uh, and uh, you know if they had like a one-stop shop where they didn't have to fill out one for free and reduced lunch one for section 8 one for head start one for you know, because all that's based on income. Is that is that a possibility or is that something that they were thinking about? I think that's a good question I could do some more research on. I can tell you that the, the free and reduced lunch eligibility data is specifically and very stringently protected by the federal food and nutrition law. So to align those federal benefits programs, I think could be done, but it would require changes to several different laws. So I think a resolution would be very, very helpful. If not for us, it would be for other school districts that have that situation and are closer to it, like Adams or uh, Greeley Evans, for example. Like, so I think it's a good idea for a resolution. I don't know if uh, I Thanks, would set for a resolution. I I tend to agree. Are there folks in favor of looking at a resolution for FF? I was just going to say we have resolution 2.8 that talks about supporting federal dollars for this. We could amend that to say state dollars would be very specific, but we already have within our legislative priorities um, something around that. So I, I think it just dovetails very nicely, including language for the state level as well. Okay. So that looks like agreement around a resolution. Um, and I do have a few questions as well. So. Um, I'm wondering if we can get data around if this were to be an application process, but we were looking 200% doesn't really seem useful, 300 or 400% would seem the numbers that would match well with the Boulder cost of living. Could we get data if we had an application process and what percentage of families fall under 300 or 400% of federal poverty guidelines and what that would look like in terms of cost? 
And then I'm also wondering if we could look at doing, sorry, I think these two go together. If we could look at doing a survey, finding out how many families, if this were available to anybody who chose to apply for it, but if an application were required, if we get a sense of roughly how many families might want to apply for that, and also whether we might have families that would be willing to either spend more for meals or to chip into a fund to help defray the costs. So I'm trying to think about the accuracy of, I mean, we can do some speculation, because <laughs> like, I think that that's what you would have to do. Uh, I, you know, the challenge is, is that I don't have income information outside of census data and outside of the folks that, that, that apply that know they're within the range to qualify. So when you're talking folks that, are, that know they wouldn't qualify, um, that, that are filling out the form and, go, and jumping through those hoops who they know they're not going to qualify, like the only data that I think like we could have that would be clean would be take all the kids that qualify for, for reduced lunch and provide them free lunch instead because that's um, that that would be like the next threshold that I could get more accurate data if if the board would be willing let me get back with our team let me think about some of the um, potential modeling we could consider and then I can get that back to you all to get some further direction in the meantime we can work on the resolution to support proposition FF Okay, I hear what you're saying. I think that there are definitely ways that we can get a general sense for how many, like say if we take, for example, a family of four with two children under 18, how many families that is in Boulder and in our district generally that would fall under 300 or 400% poverty guidelines. I think it's clearly cleaner and easier to do all or none, but if we're looking at a cost estimate, I think this conversation from the beginning has been about the fact that Boulder cost of living has no relationship to qualification for services in Boulder. And that's true in our district generally, but most pronounced in the city of Boulder. So giving reduced lunch students free lunch sounds fantastic, but also that next tier matters as well, right? All of the families that are trying to make paycheck to paycheck and can't afford school lunches, making $80,000 for a family of three, $120,000 for a family of four, it's not working and people are leaving our city and they're leaving our district for a lot of reasons, but one of those reasons is cost of living. So we can't reduce housing costs, we can't improve wages, but we can definitely look at at least what would it cost us to not charge for meals and if we know the overall cost, can we look at some of those other measurements as well is what I'm suggesting. What are the odds and averages around different tiers based on family sizes and income levels generally in the area? And or do we have any idea, even if we were to do small scale surveys, say targeting three or four of our K-5s to get a feel for how many parents would apply for this um, if it were available and if there were no means testing required? I, I'm, I'm just hearing, you know, I, I, hear, I hear your request. I'm, I'm hearing before I can commit to doing that yes or no, it feels pretty labor intensive. I think that if 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 we were to think about um, you know impacting and helping and supporting more families, like school by school basis would be the next easiest thing to do to say, right, you know, providing free lunches at schools where a certain percentage, right? But then that then you miss out on the kids that are across the district. I don't know that we have a data point in our information systems that can pull up family size within a certain home, like like a family of four, like I don't know how many family of, like, like I, don't, I just don't know the information that we have or don't have, Lisa. I'm not, I, so I, before I can commit to that, I think I need to just have a, a I need to talk with Glenn, I need to talk with our team to think about what information does the census tell us, what information does it not tell us, um, give us a little bit of time to do a little bit more homework and then maybe thinking about a, a, a path forward. I, I mean, I hear you. I guess I'm just saying I, I think I'm in favor of us giving free lunch to everyone, but if it feels like that's too big of a lift, I think we need to have more creative solutions than these approaches we're looking at. And I would start by saying that every single family in Boulder making $150,000 a year or less can't pay these funds. Everybody's trying, everybody's stretching, it's a difficult thing to do. The income limits for people who are raising families in Boulder should be much, much higher than they are. And if we can't determine how many families that is, if we have no method of deciding who we're going to help or how we're gonna help them, then I think at the very least we should be looking at what it would cost to raise to X limits 
and, and move forward with that based on the idea that it'll be less than, <laughs> than it could be, but a lot more than it is now, and, and reevaluate after a year. But I don't think something as small as giving free lunches to reduced families is going to have the impact we need. Please. So your other point about um, a fundraising effort, yeah. basically. So when the pandemic hit, um, we came up with the idea that anyone who had a balance in their account could donate it for the meals that we ended up giving out, and that worked out great. So a few weeks ago, I mentioned to Rob, perhaps in the process of buying your meal plan, for lack of a better word, your account, there could be a donation form. So, you know, that happens all the time. You go to buy something, it says, would you like to, even at Safeway, you want to add $5? I think we could implement that pretty quickly and hope that people would actually do that so that we start this little pool that every time someone goes to buy their plan, if they can afford to pay more, they could just add more at that time. I want to just go ahead. Sorry, I just want to dovetail off of what you were just saying, Stacy. That's exactly where my mind was going. I heard Lisa mention the fundraising kind of effort or strategy, and I think it is a good, possible creative solution. Um, you know, just anecdotally, parents have mentioned to me, "Oh, I would." You know, yes, it's we're on that threshold, right? But other parents have said, "I'd be happy to donate money." I loved when we did that. That was a great. That that was great. Like, let's lift each other up, and so. I don't know if we need to collect survey data to get more solid. That that might be a path forward, a creative solution if FFF if FF doesn't come come through. I don't know, but I like the idea of that creative solution from uh, the pandemic times, maybe being applied to now. Well, it feels like that is an easy thing you could do right away, and. It even if none of these other other things come up, you could still use that to pay for the kids who have a negative balance at the end of the year. I mean, it's not like that money would just go not to food. I certainly appreciate the sentiment, but when you're making commitments, right, hard dollar commitments based on potentially fundraised dollars that are one-time commitments, I think that it gets tricky unless you raise so much money that you could collect, like have an endowment for free. Like, like it just, it gets tricky when we're talking about, because if we're talking about just a year or you're talking about year over year, like to get to the recurring funds that it would potentially take with the idea and understanding that food costs go up and down, more more up than down as, as we're seeing certainly, you know, so the food costs last year were a million, you know, maybe they could go up and go more. At least, I, you know, to answer, you know, some of your concerns, I do think that there's something that we can do. I don't want to overcommit in this meeting. I, I do want to be able to take this back uh, to our team. I think that we can get a resolution um, together pretty quickly as, as step one and then begin to dig through what would be the different next levels, right? Like, so if it's, you, you know, what would be the levels where we can collect information that then we'd have an accurate um, understanding of, of what that would might potentially cost us on a recurring basis. So then when we go through the budget process, we could make a decision to say, if there's new dollars that, that come our way because the, the negative factor is, is bought down more, we'd allocate that recurring um, um, or we would reduce other things or not do other things to be able to prioritize that. But without a, without a, a more direct cost, I think I just get really nervous about making commitments that I don't know that we can sustain. So maybe some other things we can look at are city by city, what middle income housing income limits look like, what CHIFA programming rates look like city by city, and other um, programs that specifically try and target that middle income demographic that I think is the group that's struggling the most. Whether we want to look at surveys to see what our output would be or whether we want to look at income limits and data city by city to figure out what percentage of people would fall under a certain category or are most likely to qualify. I think the point is just there should be something between either everyone's going to do this unless we want to push for that or we can do almost nothing. And there are lots of very clear ways that all of the cities in our district have gone about defining what that middle income space is. So we can use that data or we can make up our own, but I would love for us to have some specific ideas around that space for how we could help families that are making, uh, I think it's 50,000 was what we had for a family of four in here, so between 50 and 150,000, give or take, based on a city by city countdown. I mean, the other way we could look at this is what would what would we think is an investment that we'd want to make this make into providing this on an annual basis, and then 
and then and then back into it that way as well, right? Like, um, because regardless of the numbers that you that you're speaking to, uh, you could set a threshold that then you might not understand the recurring cost. Whereas we could say, uh, okay, so we're gonna allocate. Um, above the above the federal threshold, we're going to allocate X number of dollars, and then based on that dollars, how many kids could we serve? And then based on how many kids we serve, what would we want to look at? Like like I like I think you could do it both ways. I do I do want to spend time with our team before I make any commitments because it does feel pretty labor intensive chasing down data that we may or may not have, or maybe it's not. Um, but I'm just not as familiar with some of the data that we collect through our information systems, our access to census data. I know Glenn has some of that access to that. I don't know that in particular. So before I, I would overcommit, I'd need to, to hear kind of from them. Okay, well, I look forward to more information. I guess I don't really see how it would be different to say we're gonna spend $2 million on this and then to try and from there figure out what income limits that would make rather than starting with the question of what different income limits would cost. But. I, I think, again, as long as there are multiple options, it sounds like in general, I think the board is enthusiastic about finding ways to expand this program to our district and looking at a variety of different levels of how that could work and what that could look like to make sure we're doing what we intend would be useful. And I'm sorry, Nicole, go ahead. No, it's, um, I was just gonna say, I, but Rob spoke to it, that I feel uncomfortable making a budgetary decision based on hopes and people's fiscal generosity year over year, that feels challenging to me. I also want to be mindful of the fact that if we're down 300 students, that's $3 million. This is an added cost. We have curriculum we need to buy. There's strategic plan items we still need to be working on. There's a lot of competing factors. And I, I want to be mindful of our staff time, um, of our budgetary and financial resources, and, and making sure that um, we're making any decision around this in context of all of that because it all works together. And it's also commendable but challenging. This is a, a community problem that we're trying to take on and how can our community partners help us in this? Um, BVSC did not create high cost of housing and, and the economic conditions that exist here. And there's a limit to which we can, I feel that we can address that within the scope of our budget that is not as generous as it should be because of Tabor and the way the School Finance Act works. I appreciate that, Nicole. I guess I just want to push back a little or add to that, that for a family with two kids in our district, $300 a month spent on school lunches could very well make the difference between whether or not we have another family that we have to count in declining enrollment the next year or whether that family stays here. So while absolutely I think everything you're saying is right, I also think there's a flip side to that budget, which is if families can't afford to stay, they won't. And this is not a meaningless cost for a significant portion of families in our district. I in no way intended that the fundraising effort would pay for all of it. I was just speaking to that there would be, you know, there's a way to supplement some of these things even now, if, if we wanted to, that's all. I, there's no way we're going to have that kind of money, especially year to year, absolutely not. But there may be a way to supplement some of the stuff we're talking about um, with just a click. And uh, just a closing statement here. BVSD does contribute to the high cost of living only because we have excellent schools and everybody wants to come here. Is there anything else for comments right now, Kitty? No, nothing. No, no. Rob? I just want to commend the board for um, for, for asking us to bring this to you all for a discussion, to really think about the complexities and challenges, whether within the district, within the community, for individual families. Um, and I think I'm excited to bring this back to our team to, to kind of really think through the complexities of this and, and, and bring back some ideas to the board to consider. In the meantime, we look forward to um, drafting um, a resolution for the board to approve in support of Prop FF. And just one last last comment here. And you know, that really, I'm, I'm serious about this, you know, because a lot of kids want to eat school lunches now as opposed to before, only because we have a great school lunch program, as opposed to other school districts that I know that have really poor school lunch programs. So I think that we're doing, you know, what's really great around our district and providing healthy food for our kids that they want to eat it. 
Okay, I think with that, um, let's see, for a special meeting, do I still need a motion to adjourn? Or do we just quit? Just you can. All right, let's do it. Thanks, everyone.